Good morning, First Church family and friends, and welcome to our online worship. If you need additional information about our church, you can find links in the description. And if you're watching on our website, check out the About page to learn more about our church and to how, how to get in contact with us. It is always good to be in the house of the Lord. And since you're watching online, I encourage you to invite God into your space right now, whether that's in your living room or in your car or on the train or sitting at your desk at the office. Ask God that he would fill your space with his presence. We're going to begin worship by singing together, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Blessings on your day.
never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You are good, good. Oh, 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 you are good. Hello, First Church. Our psalm lesson for today is Psalm number 138, and I invite you to share it with me. Uh, we will read this responsively. I will lead with the light print, and I invite you to join me with the dark print. So let us pray. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You strengthened my life. All the rulers of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord is high, but regards the lowly, yet knows the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. O Lord, fulfill your purpose for me. O oh Lord, may your steadfast love endure forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. And now let us enter into prayer. O oh Lord, the psalmist is right. You do hear us when we call to you, and you answer us. Give us understanding to see how you answer us, for sometimes... You do not answer us the way we think you should. But we trust that your answer is always what is best for us and that that answer gives us inward strength. Oh Lord, the psalmist is right. You do regard those in low places. Your heart goes out to people whose lives are controlled by others, who suffer at the hands of others, and who lack power over their own lives for whatever reason. Give us hearts like yours, God, that we may share with you in this ministry. Lord, the psalmist is right, for you deliver us from our times of trial. Lord, you do bring us through. Time and time again, your people have attested to that. You give us strength to endure whatever season we are facing. You offer us wisdom to know what to do in tough times. You bring us through the storms. The psalmist was right, Paul was right, that in all things you work for good for those who love you. Thank you, God, for the ways you deliver us, especially for the great deliverance that is before us, the deliverance from death. O oh Lord, the psalmist is right. You do not turn back from what you began. You have begun a good work in us, Lord. Continue to do so, that we may become the people you call us to be, full of hope, acting in love, and living in peace. We sing your praise, O Lord, just like the psalm writer did a long time ago. Hear our prayers, receive our gratitude, 
for your saving grace, given to us through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. I invite you to grab a Bible, if you have one near you or available, and open it to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now hold that spot when you find it. You might have to pause your, the video in order to get all this set up. Um, but uh, put a marker there and uh, turn a few pages to 1 Samuel chapter 12. And then after that, I want you to flip back a number of pages to Deuteronomy chapter 17. And if you can put like a bookmark or a pen or something in those three spots, we're going to be looking at a good amount of scripture today and hope that's okay with you. Uh, now, if you have all those pages marked, let's go back to where our actual text for today is 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is the point in Israel's history where they ask God, can we have a king? Now, before there were kings in Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel were sort of loose and they were brought, to, brought together out of Egypt by Moses. You probably recognize that name. And when, when he was coming to the end of his life, he passed leadership off to Joshua. And then Joshua led Israel through the conquest of the land of Canaan, which was the land that God had promised them. And then for the next 300 years or so, as Israel was settling down into the land, they did not have a permanent ruler. They, they stayed as 12 separate tr tribes. And now they were supposed to be under the rule of God, but the Bible describes it that they constantly did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and then he would sort of, um, or they'd sort of reject him as their ruler, and then he would let them uh, fall into oppression uh, by their enemies. And so then they would wise up, and they would cry out to God for help, and God would raise up a new leader for them, uh, referred to as a judge. And the judge would be a temporary leader that would help people out of their trouble. And they did that over and over and over again. For those 300 years, about 300 years, there was that pattern. They'd uh, they fall into sin, despair, and cry out to God. God would listen and send them a judge to deliver them, and on and on and on. Now, Samuel... Um, he is the last of these judges, and he's getting old, and his sons, well, nobody really likes them because they are crooked politicians. And so the elders of the tribes get together, and they come up with a plan. And that's where our story starts, 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning with verse 4. It says, So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. Now fast forward down to verse 19. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people had said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
This whole passage of Scripture and the notes or maybe the, the lessons that we can take from it are about the sovereignty of God. And when I say sovereignty, I mean God's rule and reign over all of creation and his people, his chosen people, both Israel then and us now. So let's start by asking a legitimate question. If God is in control, why does it always seem like everything is out of control? Or perhaps I can rephrase it this way. If God is the king, if God is ruling and reigning and, and God is sovereign, why do I feel like I have to work so hard to keep everything together? In our story, the elders of Israel are faced with two problems. The first one is their current leader, Samuel, he's getting old and his sons are terrible. The second problem is they are afraid of the warring nations. Now, where you have your bookmark in 1 Samuel chapter 12, I want you to flip to that really quick. And at verse 12, Samuel is giving a summary of what took place before he gave them a king. It says in verse 12, But when you saw that Nahash king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, No, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. Israel was fearful, and they believed that what they needed was a new ruler who would unify the 12 tribes and lead them into battle against their enemies. And Samuel is upset about this, and so he goes and tells God about it, and God tells him, it is not you they have rejected, but me. And that gives us our first note, or maybe our first lesson from today's scripture. When our actions are driven by fear and worry and anxiety, we reject the sovereignty of God. Now, to clarify, Fear and anxiety are just these uh, internal things that we don't have a lot of control over. If something makes you afraid or something makes you anxious, um, you can't really control that. What we can control is how we respond when we are feeling anxious or feeling afraid. And we do this all the time. We see trouble on the horizon and, and worry and fear. They start to uh, sort of take over and we get really busy bracing for impact. And it never even think about bringing the matter before God. And by that, I mean by praying or listening to wise counsel and being open to the spirit to reveal the way forward. We get anxious and we just get busy. If God is in control, why am I working so hard to keep everything together? Maybe the question should be, if God is in control, how can I demonstrate my faith in his sovereignty? In our story, Israel does not show any confidence in God as their king. And so they took matters into their own hands. They said, no, we want a king to rule over us. Now, there's nothing wrong with Israel wanting a king. And if we rewind the story, not 300 years, but 400 years before this, just before Israel, they've just come out of Egypt and they've wandered around in the wilderness for a number of years. And Moses is just about to let them cross over into the promised land. And Moses is also right at the end of his life. He's just about to die. God gives all of these uh, instructions about how Israel should be as a nation, and including how they should choose a king. So what's the problem here? If Israel wants a king to help them unite the tribes and help them be organized against the warring nations, isn't that actually good? Isn't that actually a strategic plan, uh, good thinking? Yes, absolutely it is. It's a really good idea, in fact. On Friday, Michelle and I were driving, um, we were driving up Route 31 in Carpentersville, and we saw all the trucks and trailers unloading and getting ready for the carnival. Ah, oh, man, I have such good, fond memories of the carnival. It reminded me, seeing the, those, all that stuff, that when I was a kid, one of the most exciting things to blow through Streeter, Illinois, every summer, was the carnival. Now, as a young kid, the carnival was almost irresistible. Where else could you get all the junk food and the rides and the lights and those games where you could win a teddy bear as big as yourself? 
When the carnival came to town, that was all we could think about. And I remember one year, we were pleading with our parents, please let us go, me and my two brothers. We want to go to the carnival. Can we go? Can we go? Can we go? You know how kids, kids can be. And my parents came back to us with a proposal. And they said, we can go to the carnival this week. Or if you're willing to wait till the end of the month, we can all go to Six Flags Great America, right up there in Gurney, Illinois. So my brothers and I, we had to make a choice. Do we go to the carnival, exciting uh, thing right there in front of us, or do we wait and go to Six Flags? We could not, could not, well, I didn't know it at the time, but we could not afford to do both. Now, we know that though the carnival is great and available that very week, it pales in comparison to the experience and the wonders of a real theme park. The problem with Israel wanting a king right then and there is that God already had a plan for them to have a king. Their plan, let's get one now because we're afraid of these nations, was the carnival plan. God's plan was the six flags. So let's listen to this description of Israel's king given by God 400 years prior to this event. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 17. This is the six flags plan. Chapter 17, verse 14. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, and not to consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. Now, imagine this. A political leader who is not under the influence of wealth, a person chosen specifically by God, who never considered themselves better than others. Does that kind of ruler even exist? Now, by contrast, just a glance back at our story, 1 Samuel 8, God says, you want a king like all the other nations? Here's what he'll be like. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will make your daughters to be perfumers and cooks, cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants, the best of your cattle and donkeys, he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. Now, do you catch the, the repetition in there? The real contrast here is that God is appointing a king who shouldn't take up extra horses, shouldn't store up wealth, won't take extra wives, and will consider others better than himself. He's, he's the good king. He's the six flags king. The carnival king, he takes and he takes and he takes and he takes. Our lesson, our second lesson, then, is that when we submit to God's sovereignty, it means we submit to his way of doing things. And if we submit to God's sovereignty, we submit to a better way. God's version of a king of Israel appointed by himself was the better way. What God would choose for us is the better life. Our way is the carnival way. God's way 
is the Six Flags way. The only way the Hughes brothers were going to Six Flags is if we gave up our desire for the carnival. We can spin our wheels all day long about why someone would choose their own way instead of God's way. And we've already mentioned that Israel was acting out of fear, but what I'm looking at in this text is that God sometimes, maybe often, maybe most of the time, will let you have your way. Like my parents in that illustration, you want the carnival, you get the carnival. God doesn't seem um, too upset about this. I mean, he seems kind of chill about the whole matter. The text says Samuel is distressed, and so he prays. And I think that's pretty good practice for all of us when we're distressed. He prays and he says, God, and God says, listen to them. Let them have their king. They're rejecting me, not you. Just like they've done to me since, since when? Since 400 years ago that I brought them out of Egypt. So we're going to hit rewind again. Back to when God and Moses, and they're just about to enter the land that God would give them. And God has already given all of his instructions about how to choose a king. And then he pulls Moses aside. And then God fills him in on what he already knows. It says this in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 16. And the Lord said to Moses, you are going to rest with your ancestors. That means he's going to die. And these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. God says, I gave them the, I'm going to give them the choice, but they're going to choose the carnival. God already knows that Israel's going to reject him as their king. He doesn't even have to draw on his great omnipotent power. It's simply the way they are, the way that we are. We are predictable, and God is going to let us have our way. So when Israel finally gets their king uh, and Samuel is distressed, God is looking at it saying, of course, that's what they're asking for. Rejecting me is what my people have always done. And I might add, we always do. We constantly live in the space between getting exactly what we want and then needing to be rescued from it. God says they are forsaking you just as, the, as they have forsaken me. But there's more in verse 18 of 1 Samuel chapter 8. It says, when that day comes, you will cry out from relief from your king that you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. Now, it sounds like God is saying, okay, that's it. I'm out. There's a bit of a pattern in the Old Testament with regards to God and his people. God establishes a promise and usually um, gives a warning with that promise. Now, the people would do okay for a while, but they will reject his sovereignty for their own desires. God lets them have their way. The people then face calamity, and they cry out to God for help. And then God would send an agent to rescue and reinstate the promise. And so here we have yet another instance where Israel rejects God's rule and reign over them. The damage has been done, the new king is installed, and Samuel is making a farewell bid. This is 1 Samuel chapter 12. So we're going to fast forward just a little bit. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. God will never fully abandon his people, even if only for the sake of his great name. He will not allow the nations to say that he abandoned his promise and rejected his people. And that's our third and final takeaway. Do not give up on God because he will not give up on you. God does not hold our sins over us and withhold his blessings from us, nor will he abandon us when we turn to him. He will not give up on you. God will not give up on you. The sovereignty of God is not disrupted by our sin. It is not sidelined by our rejection of his plan. It is not thwarted by our short-sightedness. The rule and reign of God is not so easily defeated by our poor decision-making. How do we know this? Take a look at the Bible. I'm going to just hang on a second. Let me find a Bible. There's not a Bible in here. This is ridiculous. 
Okay, check this out. Here's a Bible. Look at this Bible, I'm just holding it up here. Right here, this skinny part, this skinny portion of the Bible. This is 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is where the people of God say, all right, uh, we would rather have a king, um, uh, just like the other nations, than have God as our king. Now, does God abandon his people? No way. Look what's left. Look, the majority of the scriptures are still God trying to reconcile his people back to him. Consider that simple visual as God continually providing a way of salvation for his people. God doesn't call it quits. He refuses to give up on us. Adam and Eve sitting in the garden wasn't the end of the story. Israel abandoning God and, and being exiled to foreign nations wasn't the end of the story. God sending his own son who was crucified and buried and risen again was still not the end of the story. And you, the last time you blew it, was not the end of the story. We can trust the sovereignty of God because even when it seems like all hope is lost, God has not closed the book on the story of his rescue and redemption of the world. He will use the good and the bad to bring about his glorious purpose. So don't give up on God. He will not give up on you. My brother and sister-in-law, uh, they both contracted COVID-19. They each had fairly mild cases, uh, no emergencies, uh, no hospital visits or difficulty breathing or high temperatures or anything like that. Um, right at the tail end of her recovery, though, my sister-in-law, Brianna, started to develop some unusual pain in her feet and legs. And after a few trips to different doctors, she was diagnosed with COVID-related neuropathy, essentially what is damaged nerves that causes constant pain and numbness. We've, we've been pretty devastated by this news. Um, and she's a mom of four beautiful children, my nieces and nephew, um, and they are a handful to keep up with. She's been pretty open about her struggles with her condition, and she shared about it on Facebook the other day, and I asked her permission to share this with you. This is what she wrote. It has been three months since I first started feeling the symptoms of my post-COVID neuropathy. This has been the hardest thing I have ever had to go through. I don't know why my prayers have remained unanswered, but I know that God is in control, and going through this has made my faith stronger. I have used my pain as a reminder to pray for others, and it has made me more grateful for the blessings I do have. I will continue to be grateful for medicine that is helping me cope so I can take care of my family and for the hope that God has a plan for my future and he knows what is best for me. Friends, can I encourage you right now, don't give up on God. He does not give up on you. Brianna's faithfulness to God and all of this demonstrates her trust in, her, in his sovereignty. And I pray that we can all have this kind of confidence that God, as Paul writes in Romans, works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So let me pray for you. Lord, forgive us all the times we uttered the words, God is in control, but then refused to demonstrate faithfulness to your rule and reign. We are often anxious and troubled, but I pray that in those times your spirit reminds us of your great love and mercy. Give us the courage to trust you and the strength to carry on with your way of doing things. May we continually and each day declare Jesus as our King and set aside the idols and false gods vying for our worship and allegiance. I pray these things in his name. Amen.
the Lord was pleased to make you his own. And for the sake of his great name, the Lord will never abandon you. As you go from this place, consider what great things God has done for you and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Amen. We'll see you next week. Thank you.